Good evening, everyone. My name is George Kiraz. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome all of you. And we would like to thank the Friends of IAS for holding uh, this magnificent lecture. Um, and I would like to introduce our speaker today. The first time I heard of Zabine was not really through any of the many monographs or edited vol volumes or text editions that she produced. I just counted about 40 of them. Uh, or it wasn't through reading any of her many academic papers, and it took a while to count about 96, maybe there's more. Rather, I kept coming across Zabine uh, through interesting Facebook posts by what seemed to be a German scholar whose Facebook name was written in the Arabic script. Now it's in the Hebrew script. Her Facebook post intersected mine, and mine were always on matters related to Syriac studies. This is because one of the main characteristics that set Sabini apart from many other scholars in her scholarship and her activities, and that is inclusivity. For the past few years, Sabini has been working energetically on Shi'i thought within Islam. You would think that Zabini would surround herself with other scholars who work only on this domain. But that is not the case. Zabini's Middle East goes beyond that. Last year, I had the privilege of being here at IAS for a full year, and the group had people who worked on Arabic and Islamic studies, on Jewish studies, on Samaritan, uh, on Aramaic and on Syriac, so it was very inclusive. I saw at first hand how Zabine, in organizing talks and workshops and many activities, built a unique multifaceted community of scholars studying the multifaceted Middle East. We are gathered here today, not for a minute, for a minute. Uh, we're gathered here today to hear from Zabine that the study of the Near or the Middle East began at IAS long before the days of Glenn Bowersock or the late Patricia Krone. These are the two names that I associate with the Institute when we talk about Middle Eastern studies. I am told that Zabine's inquiry into the history of Near Eastern studies at IAS began as a pamphlet project, maybe half a dozen of pages. 119 pages later, in addition to contributions by more than 70 IAS scholars, past and present, we ended up with a 3.5 pound book <laughs> of about 700 pages. The volume is unique in that the papers are written for public consumption, so not for your typical five to 10 readers. Having said that, the papers are solid and cover a wide range of topics on the Middle East, ranging from the Bible to the Quran, Islamic, Christian, and Jewish studies, intellectual history, past and present, and there's even one paper on dots. I wonder who wrote it. So this is Zabine's Middle East. Zabine has an MA from SOAS, London, a DPhil from the University of Oxford, which she obtained in 1990, we must have missed each other for a few months then. Uh, there. And she finished her habilitation in 1999 in Bonn. She worked as a diplomat at the German Foreign Office between 1991 and 99, then joined the faculty at the Free University in Berlin as a professor of Islamic and uh, Arabic studies in 2004. She was a member at IAS twice. I thought once a member, always a member. So she was here twice in 2008 and 2013 and joined the Faculty of Historical Studies as a permanent member in 2014, succeeding Patricia Crone. I'm quite eager to hear about the history of NES at IAS. Please join me in welcoming Zabini at her own home. Thank you very much, George, for the very kind introduction. And my sincerest thanks also to the friends of the Institute for sponsoring today's um, event, um, as well as to the events team of the Institute for organizing uh, all the setup, which is wonderful. Um, and of course, to all of you for having come here today. 
The Institute for Advanced Study, which, which first opened its door in October 1, 1933, is a unique institution of its kind. Neither a pure research institute nor a university, it has spearheaded scholarship through its permanent faculty and its membership program from the very beginning. It is remarkable, however, that despite its leading role in advancing fundamental research through its initially three, nowadays four schools, little attention has been paid so far for the history of research at the IAS. Having been appointed some years ago as a permanent faculty member representing Near Eastern Studies, I was eager to learn more about the history of my own field at the Institute and soon found that the academic disciplines that are concerned in one way or another with scholarship on the Near Middle East at the IAS through its history are extremely variegated and diverse. And while the, immense, uh, while, while the imminent revel, uh, relevance of the Near and Middle East for the rest of the world, particularly its immediate neighbors, Europe and Russia, but also North America, Asia and Africa is evident, it is always challenging to explain in a few words what Near Eastern Studies in fact stands for. The disciplines that subsumed under the label Near and Middle Eastern Studies cover an enormous sp time span ranging from antiquity, here especially Babylonia and Egypt, late antiquity, and from the 7th century onwards the Islamic period up until the present time. They touch upon languages such as ancient, pre-modern, and modern Semitic languages like Syriac, Hebrew, and Arabic, but also Indo-European languages such as the uh, various linguistic stages of Persian, as well as a variety of Turkic languages, to name but the most important ones. They are concerned with an enormous denominational spectrum, Islam, Eastern Christianity, and Judaism, as well as the wide array of Iranian religions, such as Zoroastrianism, Mitraism, Manichaeism, Mazdaikism, etc. And they cover an enormous geographical area from Islamic Spain, major parts of East, West, and Central Africa, North Africa, the Arabian Peninsula and the Levant, Iraq and Iran, Central Asia, the Indian subcontinent, and parts of East Asia, most importantly, Indonesia, the Philippines, and Malaysia, as well as the western parts of China. In recent years, the scholarly exploration of Islam in the diaspora, especially in North America, Europe, Australia, Russia, etc., has also attracted the attention of scholarship. In terms of methodological approaches, scholars concerned with the study of the Near Middle East comprise historians and philologists, archaeologists, social scientists, anthropologists and ethnographers, political scientists and economists, historians of art and art, uh, architecture, as well as musicologists to name only the most important fields. Both concerns, the quest for the history of my field at the Institute and the desire to open up the discipline of Near and Middle Eastern Studies and its subjects to a wider audience, prompted me to prepare a volume which has now been published. In fact, as George says, said, I was initially just thinking of a small pamphlet. Looking to the relevant materials that are held by the Shelby White and Leon Levi Archive Center, and tracing the development of the field in its widest sense at the Institute has been a fascinating journey into the past. And I was pleasantly surprised by the many gems I found among the archive's holdings, such as Oleg Graba's rich correspondence with colleagues and friends around the world during his time at the Institute, or Otto Neugebauer's correspondence with Edward Kennedy and other close colleagues. The most, the most surprising discovery was the fact that Near Eastern Studies at the Institute dates back to the very beginning of the School of Humanistic Studies, as it was called at the time, namely to 1935, and that it is virtually the only field that has left an impact on all four schools at the IAS, including mathematics and natural sciences. My work on the archival materials resulted in a historical survey of Near Middle Eastern Studies at the IAS, which opens the present volume. Moreover, to present the wide spectrum of Near Middle Eastern studies, I approached current and former IAS scholars, faculty, members, and visitors who are engaged in one way or another in the vast field with a request to contribute to the volume's second part, Fruits of Scholarship. The overwhelmingly positive response I received was heartwarming, and taken together, the wonderful essays that are brought together in the book provide a lively, engaging, and at the same time enjoyable introduction to the richness of Near and Middle Eastern studies from antiquity up until the modern period. And it is my special pleasure 
um, tonight to thank those, some of the contributors to the volume who are with us today personally for their wonderful contributions. Glenn Bowersock, Didier Fassin, Hassan Ansari, and George Kiras. At the same time, the volume is yet another demonstration of how enormously important the IAS is for the advancement of scholarship, both through providing ideal conditions for research for its permanent faculty as well as for the temporary members, and through its enormous flexibility over the decades that supported and continues to support the exploration of new, new vistas and methodologies, individual and collaborative work modes, and that it provides the liberty to pursue interdisciplinary approaches none of which could easily be realized as a larger academic institution or university. What I plan to do in the following is to read out some excerpts of my historical sketch that introduces the book. Thereafter, I would like to uh, conclude my presentation with some reflections on the role and significance of the Institute in today's world with respect to Near and Middle Eastern studies. Let me begin reading some excerpts from the historical sketch. In 1929, Louis Bamberger and his sister Caroline Bamberger Fold approached Arwa Flexner, who had made a name for himself as an expert in higher education, to set up an, I quote, institution of higher learning where those who are assembled in the faculty and staff of the institution may enjoy the most favorable opportunities for continuing research or investigations in their particular field or speciality, and that the utmost liberty of action shall be afforded to said faculty or staff to that end. From the outset, Flexner, who in 1930 was named the founding director of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, had envisaged as a structure minimum, I quote, a series of schools or groups, a school of mathematics, a school of economics, a school of history, a school of philosophy, etc., as he vaguely describes his plans in October 1931. Mathematics was tackled first, and the School of Mathematics began working on October 1, 1933, followed um, by the School of Economics and Politics a year later. Although he had envis envisaged from the outset, including um, humanistic studies in the Institute, Flexner's plans as to which disciplines should be uh, prioritized and how they were to be structured were more vague than had been the case with the two other schools. Satisfied with the positive evo evolution of the School of Mathematics, whose members were hosted by Princeton University in Pine Hall and worked in close companionship with their colleagues in the mathematics department, Flexner envisaged a similar setup for the humanities, for which he received several proposals from Princeton University faculty. Charles Rufus Murray, since 1925 chairman of the Department of Art and Archaeology at Princeton University, was most successful in gaining Flexner's ear. He convinced the latter to form the, human, the, the School of Humanistic Studies according to the needs of his department, which had developed into one of the most uh, preeminent centers of its kind in the United States. Murray managed to convince Flexner that it would, would serve the Institute best if the nascent School of Humanistic Studies co collaborated closely with his department, and his letter to Flexner of April um, 1934 is nothing less than a blueprint for the School of Humanistic Studies. Murray describes in detail the positions he envisages, and I'm quoting, we need first a specialist in the later Middle Ages and the early Renaissance, a quattrocentrist, in short, whose preference for Italian and Northern, Northern Renaissance would be immaterial, provided he could bring to bear upon our work an outstanding competence in the period and the critical acumen and ability to synthesize the diverse phenomena of the end of the Middle Ages. Second, for our work in the illustration and illumination of manuscripts, we need the constant help of a paleographer of demonstrated authority. Third, our classical archaeologists are field workers and likely to so to continue. The research personnel at home could be profitably enlarged by, firstly, a specialist in Greek arch architecture, and secondly, by another scholar of outstanding competence in Greek epigraphy. Fourth, a Near Eastern archaeologist with a special competence in Islamic art. The recent development is of Islamic literature and history within the Department of the Oriental Languages and Literatures would provide such a scholar with the necessary assistance in the philological and historical aspects of his, of his subject. His presence in the archaeological group would be, an, uh, would be immensely helpful 
for the constantly recurring problems of Islamic influence, which often baffle the students of the medieval art of Europe." End quote. Muri concluded his letter by providing a list of scholars to be appointed to those uh, positions. And the blueprint character of Muri's letter is confirmed by Flexner's first appointments to the School of Humanistic Studies. For the field of Near Eastern and Islamic archaeology, an opportunity uh, for an appointment arose when Ernst Herzfeld, one of the leading Near Eastern archaeologists and Islamicists at the time, was dismissed in September 1935 from his position as full professor and director of the Seminar for Oriental Countries and Antiquities at the University of Berlin, Germany, which he had held since 1920. He was henceforth Moore's preferred candidate for the position at the Institute and Flexner seemed satisfied with this choice. Hatzfeld, who had earned his doctorate in 1907 in Berlin, followed by the Venia Legendi in 1909, covered an enormous range in his scholarly oeuvre. On January 28, 19, 1963, Flexner signed Hatzfeld's letter of appointment for the faculty position in the School of Humanistic Studies from July 1, 1936 onwards, which Hatzfeld accepted. The relation between Muri and Herzfeld were tense from the outset. Muri stated in one of his letters to Flexner, dated May 9, 1935, that, quote, I have every reason to believe that he is a difficult person to get on with. Muri had also hoped that Herzfeld would install his extensive collection of books and artifacts in McCormick Hall, where the Department of Art and Archaeology had its base, but Herzfeld disagreed. He wanted access to his material day and night and made the institute rent an apartment for his library at 10 Bayard Lane in the same building in which Herzfeld and his sister lived. Murray and Flexner also exchanged letters during March 1937 about Herzfeld. Murray evidently found Herzfeld to be less, less cooperative than was the case with art historian Erwin Panofsky, the first faculty appointment to the school, especially since Herzfeld was less inclined to train Princeton's graduate students than Murray had initially planned. During the first decade, the Institute also hosted um, a number of scholars in Near and Middle Eastern studies among its members. Most of them had been recommended to Flexner by Murray and or Philip Hitty, Murray's colleague in the Princeton Department of Oriental Languages. Others, like Ettinghausen or Tedesco, were forced to leave, to leave Nazi Germany and Austria. Following Herzfeld's retirement in 1944, the faculty of the School of Humanistic Studies nominated the biblical archaeologist William Albright, professor of Semitic languages at Johns Hopkins University, as Herzfeld's successor. The nomination was eventually tabled. The field of Near Eastern archaeology was discontinued in the School of Humanistic Studies for the time being, and the overall profile of the school which in 1949 was renamed the School of Historical Studies, gradually shifted towards a more Eurocentristic orientation. The school's profile was focused on classics and European history, and the faculty of the school preferred as a rule applicants working within the faculty's purview. As a result, only few members were selected during the 50s and 60s with interest in Near Eastern studies. And here a case of someone else who had been rejected, and I would write something for the very same reason. However, the continuity of Near Eastern studies in the School of Historical Studies during the 50s and 60s was ensured through a number of long-term appointments. A, a quasi-long-term uh, appointment was granted in 54 to the Iranist and historian of religion Jean-Pierre de Menasque, at the initiative of Oppenheimer. And another long-term appointment was granted to the Near Eastern archaeologist Henri Seri. It was probably around 1960 that a faculty position in the School of Historical Studies was offered to Seri. The offer coincided with his appointment as director of the Museums of France, which prompted him to decline the Institute's offer. A few years later, Seri was open to a regular long-term affiliation with the Institute, which began in 1963 and ended in 66 for health reasons. With the field of Near Eastern Studies, while the field of Near Eastern Studies was after 1944 temporarily relegated to the margins of the School of Humanistic or since 49 Historical Studies, 
It had a robust presence from 1945 onwards, though with an entirely different focus in the School of Mathematics through Otto Neugebauer, who at an early stage of his career became intrigued by the history of mathematics. In 1922, he enrolled at Göttingen Uni uh, University of Göttingen, where he pursued mathematics and theoretical physics with Arnold Sommerfeld and others. At the same time, he studied Egyptian with Kurt Heinrich Sete and Hermann Kees, and he devoted his doctoral dissertation to Egyp Egyptian unit fractions. The ancient Near East took center stage in Neugebauer's scholarly work as he pursued the study of non-Greek mathematics and mathematical astronomy through a technical cross-cultural approach. In addition to Egyptian mathematics, he embarked on learning Akkadian in order to study from 1927 onwards Babylonian mathematics, which he considered to be the foundation of all later mathematical systems in the various civilizations. Over the course of his career, Neugebauer explored many of those later traditions with primary sources in Greek and Latin, Arabic and Hebrew, Sanskrit and Ethiopic. Neugebauer's scholarship resulted in path-breaking studies and text editions on the history of the exact sciences and especially mathematical astronomy from the ancient Near East to the European Renaissance. Having received his Venia Legendi in 1927, Neugebauer taught between 1928 and 33 the history of mathematics at the Mathematical Institute at Göttingen. In April 33, he was ousted from the university, and in May, efforts were undertaken uh, to bring Neugebauer to the institute. As Neugebauer was also looking for a new home for his journal, Zentralblatt für Mathematik und ihre Grenzgebiete, founded in 32, a transfer to Princeton seemed unsuitable at that stage, and a three-year appointment to Copenhagen proved to be a better solution. At the end of 1938, Neugebauer, together with all other non-German editors, resigned from the editorial board in view of increasing pressure and censorship on the journal. His supporters renewed their efforts to bring Neugebauer to the United States. Brown University extended a formal offer to him in December 1938, for a professorship in the mathematics department. Neugebauer accepted and began to teach there in February 1939, eventually turning Brown into the leading institution in the world for the study of the history of the exact sciences. From 45, Neugebauer was also affiliated with the institute. He spent the academic year 45-6 as a member in the School of Mathematics, and in November 48, Oppenheimer approached Neugebauer, voicing, I quote, our interest in providing for a more continued association for you with the Institute for Joint Study. Since 1950, Neugebauer spent one term every second year at the Institute, an arrangement that continued until Neugebauer's 70th birthday in 1969. After he retired from Brown in the same year, Neugebauer moved to Princeton where he held a permanent appointment at the Institute as a long-term member in the schools of historical studies and natural sciences until his death in 1990. Having founded in 1947 a special department for the history of mathematics for Neugebauer, Brown University enabled him to attract younger scholars with similar interests to collaborate with him. The Institute provided him with a similar arrangement which resulted in a remarkable continuity of ancient and medieval Near Eastern uh, history of science over the uh, several decades, both in the School of Mathematics and in the School of Historical Studies. And they included people such as Abraham Sachs, Edward Kennedy, David Pingree, and other scholars. With the appointment of the medievalist Marshall Claggett in 1964 as a permanent member of the faculty in the School of Historical Studies, Arabic gained again some relevance among the permanent faculty, albeit in a limited manner. Claggett was a historian of science, focusing on physics, mechanics, and mathematics, which he approached through large-scale projects aimed primarily at medieval Latin sources, which he made available through editions and annotated translation. Whenever relevant, he also considered Greek and occasionally Arabic materials, as in his multi-volume Arch Archimedes in the Middle Ages, which he published between 64 and 84. Sometime during the last decade of his appointment, Claggett began to learn hieroglyphs. And after the completion of the last Archimedes volume, he focused exclusively on ancient Egypt, working on a series of volumes, Ancient Egyptian Science, a source book, which he published between 89 and 99 in three volumes. 
As the title indicates, the books are essentially a collection of Egyptian scientific source documents and translation, and their reception among Egyptologists was not entirely positive. Towards the end of the 60s, several developments brought new impulses into the study of the Near East at the Institute in an entirely new guise and again in several schools. Shortly after taking up office as, as director of the Institute in September 66, Carl Kaysen, eager to broaden the Institute's profile with respect to fields relevant to the contemporary world, approached Bernard Lewis, since 49, professor of the history of the Near and Middle East, at the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London, to discuss with him plans in the area of comparative historical studies. Kaysen clearly had in mind his plans to establish a school for the social sciences. Kaysen and Lewis held a first meeting in London in May 67, and three months later in August, Lewis visited Princeton to support Kaysen in his wish to appoint the anthropologist Clifford Geertz as the first faculty appointment to the School of Social Science. The two also discussed on this occasion the possibility of Lewis spending a term at the Institute, which resulted in Lewis' membership during the spring term of 69. A few years later, in February 72, two members of the school's permanent faculty initiated the process of appointing Lewis to a permanent faculty position in the school. Whether the initiative was theirs or whether they acted on behalf of Kaysen remains uncertain. Be that as it may, Kaysen was clearly eager to have Lewis appointed and tried hard yet unsuccessfully to find a donor to fund the position for him. In November um, 72, the school's faculty voted against offering Lewis a permanent position. Kaysen continued to pursue his plan to bring Bernard Lewis to the Institute, and over the course of 73, the possibility of a joint appointment at Princeton University was explored and presented to the faculty which would imply a long-term membership of one term each year for Bernard Lewis at the school. This was approved by the Historical Studies faculty in November 1. And Lewis was formally offered in December 73 a dual appointment as Cleveland Dodge Professor of Near Eastern Studies at the university and as a long-term member at the Institute for Advanced Study, which he accepted on October 1, 74. And Lewis' appointment at the IAS ended in 86. Clifford Geertz served for 30 years on the faculty of the School of Social Science from 1970 until 2000, and his scholarly focus on the Muslim world, particularly Indonesia and Morocco, led to a steady stream of members working on various aspects of the Islamic world in the school, which has continued up until the present day. On May 15, 1969, uh, Joseph Strayer, at the time head of the history department at Princeton University, approached the School for Historical Studies with a proposal that the Institute make a membership offer to Shlomodov Goiten, which would allow the latter to continue his work on the documentary Geniza once he retired from the University of Pennsylvania. Goiten had studied Goethen had studied in Berlin and Frankfurt am Main with uh, Josef Horowitz as his main mentor, under whose guidance he also prepared a doctoral dissertation titled Prayer in the Quran, 1923. He had left Germany in the same year and in April 28 joined the staff of the School of Oriental Studies at the newly founded Hebrew University in Jerusalem as instructor, later professor in Islamics. And he served as director of the School of Oriental Studies from 49 through 56. Goitin had left Jerusalem in 57 when offered a chair of Arabic studies at the University of Pennsylvania. It was some years prior to his departure from the, from the United, for the United States that he began to work on the documentary Geniza, a field that occupied him for the rest of his life. When Goitin retired from the University of Pennsylvania in July 70, only some of his aims for the Geniza project had been achieved. To bring the project to completion, he needed financial and logistic support. He was confronted with another difficulty. While he had accumulated only a small pension during his time in Philadelphia, he would be ineligible for his Israeli pension unless he returned to Israel. The overall reaction of the faculty of the School of Historical Studies to Strayer's proposal was positive, and the faculty approved a three-year appointment for Goitin. 
for a membership during the years 71 to 74. From 75 onwards, up until his death on February 6, 85, Boyton continued to be affiliated with the Institute as a long-term visitor to the School of Historical Studies. The change of status from member to visitor did not affect the financial arrangements. Throughout his time at the Institute, securing the funds to pay Boyton's stipend and to finance his research posed a continuous challenge until 83, when Goitin was awarded a MacArthur Lifetime Fellowship. The scholarly results of the investment in Goitin's research over the course of those years can hardly be overestimated. Shortly before his death, Goitin sent off the fifth and final volume of his magnum opus, a, a Mediterranean Society, the Jewish Communities of the Arab World, as portrayed in the documents of the Cairo Geniza to the publisher. Now the focus of Near Eastern studies had shifted since the early 70s to the newly founded School of Social Science. The increased visibility of the field also had an effect on the selection of members in the School of Historical Studies. While the fields of archaeology and history of science continued to attract members specializing in, Near and Middle East and in, in, in the Near Middle East, and Bernard Lewis managed time and again to bring scholars concerned with the modern history of the Near East to the Institute, the, numbers, the number of scholars working on Islamic history during the pre-monarch period rose slightly during the 70s and 80s. In 1980, Glenn Bowersock, since 62 a professor of classics at Harvard University, was appointed to the faculty of the School of Historical Studies. Aldous Giavone aptly describes Bowersock as, I quote, the quintessential historian of connection, interweaving, and displacement whose attention is drawn to sites of crossing and intersection, both physical, ge geographically divine places and cultural and mental ones, end of quote. This is the background to Bowersock's scholarly trajectory from a classicist focusing on imperial Rome and its legacy into one of the leading scholars of late antiquity and the ancient Near East up until the rise of Islam. In 1971, Bowersock published his path-breaking article, a report on Ar Arabia Provincia, which he described as a gathering together of new material on the history of Roman Arabia and a preliminary stage in the prepar preparation of the history of the Provincia of Arabia. This programmatic paper heralded Bowersock's immersion over the next 14 years into the study of languages such as Nabataean, Syriac, and Ethiopic. His most recent work, a trilogy of three monographs published between uh, 2012 and 17, concerns the Arabian background of the Prophet Muhammad, the origins of Islam in Mecca and Medina, and the first conquests. These masterpieces constitute a solid and innovative addition to the scholarship of historians who have, trained, who have been trained in the tradition of Near, East, Near Eastern, Islamic, and Arabic studies. Glenn Bowersock valued textual sources as well as material sources, and as such, he combined the methodological approaches of philology with those of history of art and architecture, as well as archaeology. In doing so, he continued the lineage of Herzfeld and Zayrik in the School of Historic Studies. At the same time, his scholarship closely connects to that of two members of the permanent faculty who represent different aspects of Near Eastern and Islamic studies in the school, and who joined the faculty at the later stage, namely Oleg Graber, who was appointed in 1990, and Patricia Krone, who joined the institute in 1997. Graber continued the early institute's tradition in Near Eastern studies, inaugurated by Ernst Herzfeld. Herzfeld's erstwhile assistant and later friend of advisor, Richard Ettinghausen, was Graber's principal mentor and predecessor at Ann Arbor. Moreover, like Herzfeld, Graber opened entirely new horizons for the field. Both covered an unusually wide range of fields and shared a wider perspective on their respective objects of study than was the case with most of their respective predecessors and colleagues. On the other hand, the two scholars represent two opposite angles in the development of their respective fields. Herzfeld was one of the last scholars to represent the German tradition of Near Eastern archaeology and art that had come to an end with World War I, whereas Graber, by contrast, laid the foundation for a methodologically more refined 
and far more sophisticated discipline of Islamic art history, whose center of gravity was the United States, and which continued to thrive after his demise. Besides his contributions to scholarship, Graber is to be credited for two additional achievements. It is thanks to him that Near Eastern and Islamic studies was formally established as a, school, uh, as a field of its own in the School of Historical Studies, this being the precondition for guaranteeing it an equal annual share of members, which led to a significant and stable increase in the number of scholars in this field. Moreover, Graber was instrumental in having Patricia Croner appointed as a permanent member of the faculty, which further consolidated the field in the School of Historical Studies. Patricia Croner, member of the permanent faculty from 1997 uh, to 2014, was a scholar of early Islamic political, social, and intellectual history. As such, she represented a different discipline within Near Eastern studies than had been the case with Herzfeld and Graber on the one hand, and Neugebauer and his circle on the other, though she was at the same time closely connected to her predecessors, Herzfeld and colleagues, Bausop and Graber, through her interest in pre-Islamic Arabia, late antiquity, and Iranian notions and culture. With her scholarship, Cronus significantly influenced and in many ways pro professionalized and modernized the study of Islamic history. Cronus' last major oeuvre that she was able to complete before her untimely demise was her prize-winning monograph, The Nativist Prophets of Early Islamic Iran, Rural Revolt and Local Zoroastrianism, a study of the Iranian response to the Muslim penetration and of Iranian religious beliefs and notions that persisted and influenced Islam far beyond Iran during the early Islamic period, a book she had envisaged writing already during her early days as a scholar in Oxford. Moreover, Kron's scholarship had a great impact on readers in the Islamic world, um, uh, much more than had been the case with any of the other N, uh, NES scholars among the Institute's permanent faculty up until that point, through translations of her work into Arabic, Persian, and Turkish, as well as original publications, especially in Iran. Through the development of the field of, at the Institute over the past eight Though the development of the field of the, at the Institute over the past 80 years may seem arbitrary at first sight, it very much reflects the overall evolution of Near Eastern studies over the past century. Although the beginnings of Near Eastern and Islamic archaeology and art history date back only to the 19th century, it soon developed into the leading discipline among the various directions of Near Eastern studies, not least as a result of the state-sponsored patronage it enjoyed especially in Germany prior to World War I and in France during the Mandate period. Hatzfeld was one of the leading scholars uh, Germany, German academia produced at the turn of the 20th century, and the continuation of the field at the Institute through a long-term appointment for the French Near Eastern archaeologist Henri Serre seemed perfectly logical at the time. Her respective prominence notwithstanding, both Zeyrig and perhaps even more Hartsfeld marked the end of, the, of an epoch. Near Eastern archaeology never regained the prominence it had before World War II and for Germany specifically before World War I. Both Neugebauer and Goitain picked up earlier trends in scholarship, but in both cases, those trends were marginal prior to them, and they successfully turned them into something truly magnificent defining entirely new areas of scholarship. The history of science of the ancient and medieval Near East was established as a field of its own through Neugebauer, as was the study of social history in the, during the Middle Ages through the lens of the Geniza through Goitain. Moreover, both Neugebauer and Goitain succeeded, successfully collaborated with younger scholars and by doing so took care of the continuation of the respective fields of scholarship. This being something Herzfeld had, with few exceptions, never done and apparently never tried to do. Embarking on and outlining entirely new fields of research was likewise characteristic of Bowersop, Rabar, and Kroner. All three were instrumental in propelling their respective areas of scholarship into a new age. Rabar's success in establishing the field of, his, of history of Islamic art goes hand in hand with his endeavor to have the Institute nominated a successor working in an area that represents some of the core fields of Islamic studies. This role is no longer played by historians of Islamic art. 
In Islamic studies during the second half of the 20th century, it is the study of Islamic history writ large that has taken center stage. The Institute, through its School of Historical Studies, also regularly supports areas within the humanities that are immensely significant, but often lack structural in underpinnings in the academic institutions of North America and Europe. This began in 1947 during Oppenheimer's directorship, where the Directors Fund was established to support such areas in all land free schools. Recent examples in the area of Near Eastern studies include efforts to foster scholarship on Eastern Christianity and Syriac studies. A further example is the Shi Studies Research Program, made possible by the Carnegie for Corporation of New York, an initiative um, to foster uh, this largely marginalized field and to encourage other academic institutions to grant Shi Studies its due place in their curricula. Most importantly, however, the School of Historical Studies membership program ensures an annual cohort of some five to six uh, or seven scholars working in entirely different fields of Near Eastern studies, from Ottoman studies to modern Middle Eastern studies, ancient and Iranian, st ancient Iranian studies, Quranic studies, social and intellectual history, and so on. In addition, the School of Social Science also continues to hold several scholars working on the Near and Middle Eastern context annually. So far, my selections from the historical sketch, and, and I hope that uh, you found them interest, they made you curious, and there's much more in the introduction. Um, and I would like to refer you to the publisher's table where you have a significant discount uh, for this event. Now, please allow me to conclude with some additional thoughts on the Institute's mission and more specifically on Near Eastern studies in my own field of research, the intellectual history of the Islamic, of the Islamic world. Over the course of its history, the IS has provided through its different schools the most favorable research opportunities to thousands of scholars, circumstances which particularly favor the advancement of fundamental research. In many ways, the Institute facilitates scholarships, scholarship in areas that can often hardly be pursued elsewhere, be it for economic, political, or other reasons. Beyond fundamental research, which is often hard to pursue at universities, Interdisciplinarity can be pursued much more easily and spontaneously at the Institute than elsewhere. While all this holds true for most areas of scholarship at the Institute, Near Eastern and especially Islamic studies is perhaps more than any other area affected by political developments. Discussing the cases of Herzfeld and Zeyrich, I have already shown that the end of the colonial era fundamentally changed the circumstances under which Near Eastern archaeologists had worked. In today's world, the rise of sectarianism all over the Islamic world, the ever-growing pressure by proponents of a traditional literalist uh, strand to suppress diversity and to silence alternative interpretations of Islam, many of which entertain an explicitly rational perspective, and the struggle among the most powerful players of the region for hegemony had an immediate, have an immediate impact on how Islamic studies is perceived in North America and Europe and what is being taught and where censorship or self-censorship kicks in. Let me demonstrate this with respect to Iranian studies, a discipline that has been largely neglected over the past decades in US academia. Although it covers an enormous time span, close to 2,500 years, and concerns an area of immense cultural significance in most world religions, Iranian studies is a niche discipline in the US. While the field expanded considerably in the US after World War II, and especially during the 60s and 70s, this trend was reversed as a result of the Iranian Revolution of 79, the Iran, the, the Iran hostage crisis, and the ensuing freezing of diplomatic relations between Iran and the US ever since April 1980. The growing sectarianism in the Middle East and the rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran for hegemony in the region is an additional aspect that needs to be reckoned with. And it ties in with the funding situation of near and uh, near Middle Eastern studies in the US. While potentially Iranian private and governmental donors have been barred by the sanctions over the past decades from funding academic initiatives in the US, Saudi Arabia has evolved since the late 70s as the larger donor to U.S. universities. 
Most of the most, most of the, uh, some of the most important U.S. chairs and centers in Islamic studies are funded by and named after members of the Saudi royal family, in addition to more recent donations by private individuals from the Gulf region, all of whom share a strong anti-Iranian and anti-Shi'i bias. This not only prompts contemporary U.S. academia to focus on Arabic to the exclusion of other Islamic languages that are no less important, it also leads to an increasingly narrow focus on mainstream, that is mostly Sunni Islam, to the exclusion of the Shi'i world in its multifarious forms, as well as any other strand that is critiqued by contemporary Salafism, Islamic philosophy, Sufism and mysticism, rational thought in theology and legal theory, occult sciences, etc. In recent years, some U.S. academic institutions have begun to reverse the trend by putting Iranian studies back on the map through gifts by Iranian expatriates who, le who left their country for the U.S. either during or shortly after the Islamic Revolution of 7980. The animosity harbored by the majority of these donors against Iranian religious establishment and Islam in general on the one hand, and their pride in the Iranian culture and history which is best reflected in their view in pre-Islamic Iranian culture on the other, results in an often exclusive approach to matters Iranian and the ensuing lack of academic structures that allow for naturally bringing together scholarship in Iranian studies and cognate fields, particularly Islamic studies. As a result, Iranian studies in present-day U.S. Uh, um, focus mostly on three areas, pre-Islamic Iran, ancient and pre-modern Iranian language and literature, and Iranian political and social history during the modern period. The detachment between Iranian expats on the one hand and the social, intellectual, and political reality in Iran after the revolution of 79 on the other also generates a lack of proper understanding among policymakers, commentators, and consultants in the U.S. of what is going on in Iran itself. Well, there's no lack of highly qualified commentators in the media and the administration for the Arab world, most of those cons consulted on Iran are largely unfamiliar with the religious notions of in law, legal theory, doctrine, and political, doctrine, political theory that constitute the backbone of the political class in present-day Iran whose representatives are all Hausa taught, Hausa being the traditional institutions of learning with Qum as its center and are thus unable to distinguish the different layers and strands among their representatives. The often exclusive approach to matters Iranian further obscures the fact that Iran was for centuries home to some of the most important centers of Islamic intellectual life, and that many of the leading Muslim intellectuals hailed from Iran. For example, famous think thinkers such as Farabi, Avicenna, Ghazali, Fakhadin Razi, to name but a few, were all Iranians. And that scholarship on the intellectual history of the Islamic world cannot be limited to source, sources that are either in Arabic or in Persian to the exclusion of the respective other. The current programs in Iranian studies largely neglect Iran's intellectual history during the Islamic era, while scholars of Islamic studies who are concerned with intellectual history often discard primary materials in Persian and the enormous research literature produced by Iranian scholars, constricting themselves to what is readily available. In view of the constantly growing antagonism between Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the ever-increasing sectarianism in the Islamic world, it is important to recognize the deep entanglement between the principal Islamic languages and literatures, Arabic and Persian, and between the various religious factions and ruminations within Islam, especially Sunnism and Shiism in its variegated forms. The Institute, with its commitment to fundamental research and its relative freedom from political pressure of any kind, is uniquely positioned to mitigate any such biases in scholarship. Studying the intellectual history of Iran, particularly during the Islamic period, has been one of the areas of scholarship of my predecessor, Patricia Krone, and of myself. Moreover, the IAS regularly hosts members specializing in Iranian studies at the School of Historical Studies and the School of Social Science. With respect to salvaging the rational heritage of Islam, that as it has been preserved, especially among the Shi branch, uh, Shis of the Zaidi branch, the IAS is engaged in building a virtual repository to provide access to the rich and yet widely dispersed and endangered Zaidi manuscript tradition, 
a collaborative project together, together with Hill Museum and Manuscript Library in Minnesota. In addition, I've already mentioned the Xi Studies Research Program that is graciously funded by the Carnegie Corporation of New York and will continue for yet another year. The liberty to pursue research without political and economic restraints is definitely a privilege. And more than anything else, it requires an engaged public audience and donors who believe in the visions and the work of the scholars working at the IAF. Let me end by expressing my gratitude for your belief in me and my colleagues and your ongoing support in us. Without trustees, the friends, and any other supporters, we would be unable to pursue any of the research we engaged in, and which, so I hope, is a modest contribution to the betterment of mankind.